Maternal Adaptation During Pregnancy. Women want confirmation of pregnancy, whether the pregnancy may be intentional or unintentional. <clears throat> we have what we call presumptive or possible signs, which is subjective data that the woman experiences and reports to the healthcare provider. Taken alone, each one of those signs can have other causes beside pregnancy. The presumptive signs of pregnancy can have other potential causes, such as tender breasts. These could be caused by hormonal changes. Amenorrhea, or that missed period, could be due to a hormonal imbalance, emotional distress, or illness. Frequent urination might be because of a UTI or nervousness. Fatigue might be because of anemia, a lack of sleep, overexertion, infection. Nausea might be because of emotional stress, infection, gastritis. Then we move from presumptive to probable signs, which are measured by a trained examiner. Some of the other potential causes of these uh, probable signs include the presence of HCG in the blood. This can be due to a high data form mole. Presence of HCG in the urine could be due to a choriocarcinoma. Uterine growth might be due to tumors. The Chadwick sign or the bluish purple color of the cervix, vagina and perineum is another probable sign along with the Hegar sign which is softening of the uterine isthmus the Goodell sign is softening of the cervix, and belotment, which is where the fetus will bounce back against the examiner's fingers. Well, tumors can do that too. And then positive signs. They're the only signs that are 100% diagnostic of pregnancy and cannot be attributed to anything else. And that would be diagnostic confirmation, such as an ultrasound or the fetal heartbeat. Positive signs of pregnancy, we can have visualization of the fetus by ultrasound. We can have fetal heart sounds by the fetal stethoscope or a Doppler. We have fetal movements that are palpated by a trained practitioner. So question, starting somewhere around the sixth week of pregnancy, HCG begins to be found in the urine. However, HCG in the urine is not a positive sign of pregnancy. What could its appearance in the urine be due to? And that is the choriocarcinoma. So reproductive changes are going to occur during to the are due to the pressure that's exerted by the growing fetus and that expanding uterus or maybe even due to hormonal changes. So uterine changes, we have a change in the weight and capacity, the wall structure, it expands from the pelvis into the abdominal cavity and will actually double in size by week 20. The blood supply to the uterus is also going to increase. And the woman may start having Braxton Hicks contractions during that first trimester. Usually they're painless at that point and she might not even feel them. In the second trimester, those contractions usually remain painless, but now she's able to palpate them. But in the third trimester, they get stronger and they might be uncomfortable. They can also be regular, making mom think that she is in labor. The cervix, we begin to have vascular congestion. 
and a mucus plug will form in the opening of the cervix. It kind of prevents bacteria and stuff getting into the uterus. Not 100%, but it does help. And it's expelled shortly after or before or after labor begins. At this point, we'll see tiny capillaries break open when it's expelled, and it causes what we call that bloody show. With a vagina and perineum, it's affected also by hormonal changes and increased blood supply to the area. The vagi uh, vagina will take on a purple, uh, I can't talk, bluish purplish U, which is the Chadwick sign due to that vascular congestion. It increases secretions due to increased blood flow and the breasts begin to become tender in the first few weeks of pregnancy. They increase in size and there may be some nodules in that breast tissue due to prolactin. The areola becomes prominent and has a deepened pigmentation. There might be some prominent projections of those Montgomery tubercules, the sebaceous glands which help lubricate the nipple and keep it supple and keep it from drying out and cracking. They may start showing some stria or those stretch marks and they start producing colostrum which is a thick yellow fluid that precedes milk production and it's what is produced the first three days following delivery but it can be expressed or can leak from the nipples during pregnancy. So what happens to the rest of the body during pregnancy? Well, the endocrine changes. We begin to see an enlargement of the pituitary. Prolactin levels will increase progressively, which helps produce breast milk. Oxytocin will stimulate labor contractions and stimulate the letdown reflex during lactation. The thyroid gland will increase in size and the need for insulin increases. In the blood, blood volume will increase by 40 to 45% from pre-pregnancy levels. Red blood cell volume will increase by up to 30%. Plasma volume increases by 50%. Hemoglobin will slightly decrease to 11 to 12.5 because of hemodilution, and this is considered normal unless it falls below 11. Hematocrit will also decrease along with the hemoglobin. And clotting factors increase. However, they do remain within normal limits, but it does place the woman at an increased risk for DVTs, along with venous stasis caused by the enlarging uterus. Cardiovascular. The blood pressure will decrease slightly during the first trimester, and especially the second, but it's more normal during the third trimester. The heart rate will increase an average of 10 to 30 beats a minute, and the cardiac workload and output will increase. She may experience some supine hypotension, usually during the latter half of the pregnancy because of the weight of the uterus and the fetus on and compressing that vena cava if she lies supine. So she should always have a left hip tilt at the minimum or lie on her left side. The right side's okay, but the left helps improve cardiac output. With respiratory, nasal congestion is very common and voice changes could be possible due to vasocongestion. Accommodations to maintain lung capacity through hormonal changes that loosen the ligaments uh, also allow that thoracic diameter to increase. Mom may feel short of breath when she has that normal breathing pattern. 
In the third trimester, the diaphragm pressure is going to increase as that fetus enlarges. Musculoskeletal changes, we begin to see lordosis, which it increases because of that altered center of gravity. In other words, uh, that lower back is now beginning to push out because of that expanding uterus. And we may also see diastasis recti abdominis, which is a separation of the muscle that supports the abdomen. We don't see it in all women, but we may see it in some. Changes in the gastrointestinal, nausea, vomiting are very common in the first trimester. Not seen with everyone though. Intestines are displaced to the sides and upward as the fetus grows. Pressure changes in the stomach and esophagus can lead to pyrosis or heartburn. Constipation might happen because of those compressed organs and slower gastric motility as the pregnancy progresses. And this also increases mom's risk of gallstone formation. As far as the urinary system, we see renal and ureteral dilation. We see decreased peristalsis, which increases the risk for pyelonephritis. The glomerular filtration rate will increase by 50%, causing increased urination in the third trimester. It's also attributable to fetal pressure on the bladder. And glycosuria can be present as glucose is not absorbed well during pregnancy. And as far as skin, we may see the cloasma, which is that mask of pregnancy. It looks like brown blotchy areas on the forehead, the cheeks and the nose, or linea nigra, which is the skin in the middle of the abdomen, usually starting around the umbilicus and going down to the pubic area. We have a really darkened line. And stria or those stretch marks can develop on the abdomen or the breasts or the thighs in response to those elevated glucocorticoid levels and stretching of the skin. So question, during pregnancy, the pituitary gland and thyroid gland shrink in size. This is false. They actually both increase in size. So many factors influence how a woman adjusts to pregnancy and her future role as a parent. Family influences, her own personality, her social support and or her partner, and potential of depression. During the first trimester, her task is to accept this pregnancy. Often she'll be introverted and is focused on herself and the changes in her body at this point. In the second semester, she begins to accept the baby, usually becomes more extroverted, and some partners will experience some of the same pregnancy symptoms, and this is called the Cuvade syndrome. The third trimester task, mom prepares for parenthood. She begins to set up that nursery, chooses a name. Now she's becoming tired of being pregnant. And this is also a good time to consider attending childbirth classes. There are changing nutritional requirements of pregnancy because that fetus needs nutrients and energy to build new tissue. To be perfectly honest, the fetus will take the nutrients, mom gets the leftovers. So mom needs nutrients to build up her blood volume and her maternal stores. There is an increased demand for energy and for almost every nutrient type. Most nutrient requirements can be met through careful attention to the diet but several nutrients will require supplementation during pregnancy. Energy requirements and weight gain for fetal growth and development in maternal stores include 
increased caloric intake of 300 kilocalories per day during the second and third trimesters. It is recommended uh, that weight gain be dependent upon the pre-pregnancy BMI. First trimester, usually it's only going to be one to four pounds. The remainder of the pregnancy is usually about a pound per week for a total weight gain of 25 to 35 pounds for a normal BMI. Weight gain adjustments will be made on that pre-pregnancy weight. A low pregnancy weight gain can lead to neonatal complications, but a high pregnancy weight can lead to a large newborn, again, neonatal complications and potential cesarean section. Protein requirements, the growth and repair of fetal tissue, placenta, uterus, breast, and maternal blood volume requires increased protein, which is usually obtained from animal sources, including milk and milk products. Mineral requirements are going to prevent deficiencies in the growing fetus and maternal stores. Iron is needed for the formation of hemoglobin and, of course, is essential to the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood for not only the mom, but the fetus. And nature is going to rob mom to provide for the fetus. Multiple fetuses, in other words, if there's twins or triplets, etc., they will require an even higher iron intake. Calcium is needed for nerve cell transmission, muscle contraction, bone building, and blood clotting. It can also redu blah, 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 reduce the risk of preeclampsia. The body is going to take calcium from the bones if it's low. It does require vitamin D to absorb so mom usually is going to take a calcium supplement. Phosphorus is required to promote strong bone growth. Zinc is required for fetal growth and maternal milk production. And we get this from meat, seafoods, and whole grains. And iodine is going to promote normal thyroid activity and helps prevent specific birth defects and cognitive defects. So these mothers should be using iodized salt. So as far as vitamins, these are often obtained from fruits, grains, vegetables, proteins, and dairies. We're looking at folic acid. It is necessary for the formation of the nervous system and can prevent up to 70% of neural tube defects. The diet needs to include at least 400 micrograms of folic acid a day. So those supplements, as we've mentioned before, should begin pre-pregnancy. They are found in fortified foods in addition. Vitamin A is recommended um, through beta carotene, but too much can be toxic to the fetus. But too little can stunt fetal growth and cause impaired dark adaptation and night blindness. We find this in yellow, orange, and red vegetables. Vitamin C is essential in the formation of collagen, which is a necessary ingredient for wound healing. It's found in the citrus fruits, the papaya, strawberries, broccoli, tomatoes, etc. Vitamin B6 is necessary for the healthy development of the fetus's nervous system. Vitamin B12 is needed to maintain healthy nerve cells, red blood cells, and form DNA, and we find that in the animal sources. So a lot of women are usually required to take the prenatal multivitamin supplement or women that have nutritional risk factors will be taking this. Iron supplementation is recommended for all pregnant women after 28 weeks gestation. And if she has a low hemoglobin, is obese, carrying twins, higher doses of iron might be necessary. 
Again, folic acid supplementation is recommended prenatally and during pregnancy to help prevent that neural tube defects. Practices that mom should avoid is limiting intake to avoid weight gain, consumption of unwashed fruits and vegetables, unpasteurized dairy products, raw eggs, Undercooked meats can all be harmful to the developing fetus. Food preparation guidelines. Wash hands and foods thoroughly. Cooking foods thoroughly and storing foods appropriately. Listeria precautions. Cold hot dogs or lunch meats. Soft cheeses, unless they're made with pasteurized milk meat spreads, smoked seafood that's not cooked in a recipe, and unpasteurized milk should all be avoided. Seafood recommendations, no shark, swordfish, king mackerel, or tilefish, and no more than two to three servings per week of other fish, and no more than six ounces of white tuna or 12 ounce light tuna per week. With vegetarian, uh, women who are vegetarians, there are different categories of vegetarians. Protein is an area of concern, and iron and zinc requirements are also an area of concern. Women who have a lactose intolerance may have a calcium deficiency, which is a big concern. And pica. This is an ingestion of non-food substances, usually will indicate an iron deficiency anemia. So question, which vitamin is most important for the development of the central nervous system? And that is your vitamin B9 or folic acid. True or false, a vegan who is pregnant should consider taking vitamin supplements during the pregnancy. This is true. And now the post-test.